Thank you very much, and of course, thanks also for including us on the panel. Um, and uh, it's certainly a really timely discussion, so really, really great to be here too. Um, I mean, I think, of course, the New York Declaration needs no introduction at this point, but um, I mean, of course, in addition to the Migration Compact, the, the Declaration did request the High Commissioner for Refugees to propose a global compact on refugees. Um, to respond to large refugee situations. And yes, we are the pen holder, um, unlike the case on the migration side. Um, that said, the compact is being elaborated with states, taking into account the views of a wide range of others. But nonetheless, the idea is that this is a compact that will be presented to the General Assembly and be adopted by consensus. So while we are holding the pen or the screen, um, I mean, it is still very much subject to interstate consultations. Um, and I mean, as I'll say at the end, they have been extremely engaged. Um, I mean, just in terms of the process, um, the process has been extensive. We had five thematic consultations last year, um, including states and a whole wide range of other stakeholders as well. We had a stock taking at the High Commissioner's annual protection dialogue in Geneva, and this year we have now had four, uh, four rounds of formal consultations on the draft text. Um, this has been an iterative process. We have produced a revised draft after almost every set of formal consultations. We re re released the last draft, it's the third draft on Monday, and we have another set of consultations next week. Um, our final, like the GCM, our final consultations are in July, so the document will be hopefully, touch wood, um, finalised this summer and sort of formally adopted towards the end of the year, we hope. Um, in terms of the current structure of the draft, at the moment it has four parts. This first is an introduction, which sort of deals with background, guiding principles, objectives, and also the issue of prevention and root causes. Um, Part two of the document is the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, which was already adopted as Annex 1 to the New York Declaration um, in 2016. It's being applied already by UNHCR in 14 countries and two regional situations around the world. And of course, lessons learned from the application of the CRRF, as we call it, are being taken into account in developing the compact as a whole. Um, the third part of the compact is the program of action which is intended to underpin and support the application of the CRRF and this has two subparts which I'll, which I'll focus on. One on mechanisms for burden and responsibility sharing and the second is areas in need of support by the international community and the fourth section of the compact is follow up and review. Um, there's a lot to unpack in the compact but I think also the discussion this morning and the issues we've touched on um, you know, already briefly, I think what I wanted to just briefly focus on is part A, the mechanisms for burden responsibility sharing, because indeed this has been the area of the compacts that has attracted the most attention. And I think also is very important to understand in terms of what we as UNHCR see as being the heart of the compact and what we're trying to achieve with it and sort of the animating logic behind the compact. Um, I mean, these principles, international cooperation, solidarity, burden sharing, responsibility sharing, they are long-standing principles in the refugee regime. The Refugee Convention, the 1951 Convention, refers to the need for international cooperation in its preamble. Um, uh, this is a key principle of the UN Charter as well, of course. Um, but with some 84% of refugees currently hosted in developing countries, there's a need to transform this into concrete and practical action. Paris 68 of the New York Declaration took some way to, so took us some way forwards. Um, states committing to more equitable and predictable sharing of the burden and responsibility for hosting and supporting the world's refugees. Um, in the current draft of the GCR, we describe refugee issues as a common concern of humankind and robust cooperation is needed in response to this. Perhaps parking the issue of the EU, which I'm sure will come up, but um, <laughs> Um, the Global Compact on Refugees proposes two innovations um, which aim to reduce pressure on countries that are receiving large numbers of refugees. The first is the global mechanism um, in the form of a regular global refugee forum um, which will be held at ministerial level. We propose the first one to be held next year, the second in 2021, and then every four years thereafter. Um, at forums, all states 
and other relevant stakeholders will be called on to make concrete pledges towards the achievement of the goals of the Global Compact. These pledges could include financial, material and technical assistance both to host countries but also in certain circumstances to countries of origin where uh, where appropriate in, ter in terms of enabling conditions for voluntary repatriation. Um, pledges and contributions could also include review of national laws, practices and policies, and resettlement places and complementary pathways for admission for those with international protection needs. Pledges and contributions themselves will be determined by each state or stakeholder according to their capacities. UNHCR will establish a mechanism to track the pledges, um, and in addition, the forums will be the main vehicle for taking stock, reviewing and measuring progress against the objectives of the compact, um, ensuring the achievement of collective outcomes. Maybe to, <laughs> this builds on the non-binding issue, but in proposing this model, what we really have sought to achieve is a balance or to thread the needle, if you like, between the legally non-binding, because our GCR is also, of course, in principle, legally non-binding aspect of the compact, um, We've sought to balance that with the real need that we have heard for the compact to make progress in terms of burden and responsibility sharing. We see the compact as a framework for cooperation to which all states and other stakeholders agree to contribute, taking into account their existing contributions, their national realities, their capacities and levels of development and respecting national policies and priorities. That's the global. In terms of... Um, uh, the second innovation in the text, um, we have proposed the establishment of support platforms to address specific refugee situations. This would involve grouping of states dedicated to mobilising support for a particular host country and facilitating the search for solutions. Um, support platforms would be um, would aim to promote context-specific, predictable, broadened support for refugees and their hosts. Um, in support of national response arrangements by host countries. They would be assisted by UNHCR but engage a wide range of stakeholders, um, including, of course, development actors and I think um, such as the World Bank. And we've seen also through the, the you know, previous comprehensive responses that the increasing engagement of um, you know, development actors in contributing additional resources to enhance refugee and host community resilience and ensure that the impact of the arrival of large numbers of refugees on an affected state is taken into account in development planning. This is really one of the crucial additionalities that we are seeing sort of and the shifts that we're seeing. And we hope the support platforms will be able to enhance that. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, just in the context of the compact as a whole, and again, there's a lot more to the compact, but we do think these two proposals specifically in terms of architecture could really be a step forward in building more predictable, sustained and equitable burden and responsibility sharing. They seek to broaden the base of support that contribute of states um, and others that are not usually re involved in refugee responses, um, including, and this is I think a parallel with the GCM, a strong multi-stakeholder approach and partnership approach which underpins the compact as a whole and this is another key feature of the GCR too. Um, these, these instruments in the GCR as a whole would facilitate sustained political attention to refugee issues, the contributions of hosting countries, and provide forums for state-to-state -state accountability for pledges and contributions and support. Um, I don't want to dwell on the negatives, but I did just quickly want to touch on what the GCR is not or does not seek to do. Um, it builds on the existing refugee protection regime that has been established over decades. It includes custom international and regional instruments, GA resolutions, uh, conclusions by UNHCR's executive committee, state practice, judicial interpretation. It's a very, very rich body of jurisprudence. Um, the GCR does not replace this. It does not reiterate it. In other words, this is not a document that is the A to Z of refugee protection. And I think this is vital, um, you know, and, and vital for sort of many of our friends in NGOs and civil society and in academics to understand. This has been quite deliberate. What we have sought to do with this compact is to um, ensure the better functioning of the existing regime in the particularly challenging circumstances of large refugee movements. Um, and likewise, of course, the compact does not alter UNHCR's mandate. Um, rather, it does aim to engage a wide range of stakeholders in comprehensive responses according to their mandates, their resources, their capacities and expertise. We will play, we will play a catalytic and supportive role. Uh, we're not going to do everything. Um, and that's really an, a, a, also an animating logic, I think, of the compact. And I think also perhaps building on the discussion, foreshadowing a bit the discussion, and also what Marie said in terms of 
the coherence between the GCM and the GCR um, and the broader relevance of the refugee compact beyond refugee situations, um, including, of course, large mixed movements of refugees and migrants. Um, the Global Compact on Refugees is intended to address large refugee situations. I mean, I think this is clear and it's intended to mobilise better support for host countries and host communities that are affected by these situations. Of course, in reality, large movements are not always uh, homogenous and the New York Declaration itself reflected common challenges that refugees and migrants often face when they move irregularly together. Um, the New York Declaration contains separate commitments for refugees and migrants. It also contains commitments that apply to both groups. And these common commitments are really related to the practical challenges that arise in mixed movement situations. Um, in the latest draft, draft three of the GCR, we sought to um, include language that acknowledged the operational and practical challenges that mixed movements or other complex situations such as displacement caused from natural disasters may pose to highlight the possibility that affected countries need to seek support from the international community in addressing these challenges, potentially drawing on elements from the GCR's program of action where these are relevant as well as the need for cooperation between relevant actors in providing support, including, of course, cooperation between UNHCR and IOM. Um, and in terms of coherence between the compacts, as Marie said, I think we are, we are moving forward now that the compacts are taking what we hope will be their, their final shape. But I think, you know, agreeing with Marie, I think our joint objective is to ensure that operational responses speak across the compacts in addressing com com um, common challenges while, while recognising that the compacts have different scope, purpose and indeed starting points. Um, and we have proposed in the GCR sort of pragmatic operational language, which will be discussed by states next week. Um, but we've also welcomed Rev2 of, of the GCM in this regard, and I, I think we're getting there. Um, so just, just finally, I mean, I think, you know, in, in the GCR as well, there has been really constructive, positive engagement by states, convergence much, much stronger than areas of divergence. Um, we see states actively working through those issues that remain, and we're very hopeful, and we're also very excited um, about the compact's potential to transform the way the international community responds to refugee situations. And just to return again, the multi-stakeholder approach is a key part of the GCR too. Um, academia and civil society have been deeply engaged. <laughs> I have read through <laughs> many, many written submissions, thoughtful, carefully worded, wonderful written submissions and ideas from civil society and from various academics for which we thank you. And um, we are, of course, counting on you when and if the document is adopted to support implementation because this will be key. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think, yeah. e extremely insightful, particularly on the key points from, from the GCR, from your perspective. Can I ask the, the, the hard question, which is, from a short-term perspective, it seems that there is a downward trend in terms of commitments. And, and, and I appreciate that the, that the Compact takes a flexible solidarity approach to this. You can contribute in many different ways but there is sort of systemic underfunding. We're seeing states, in some cases, reduce their resettlement commitments, such as the United States. Other countries are increasing, but perhaps in a much more uh, conditional sense. Do you have a concern that, that, what is the plan B if you see a general contraction in the commitment, even as the means of, means of committing has broadened the overall um, that the overall baseline is, is too low, really, to, to, to be sustainable? Um, I mean, I think, frankly, we're not so negative. I mean, of course, there are certain exceptions at the moment, but I think that the engagement by states in the GCR has been real, and there is commitment there. And I do think we shouldn't underestimate the quite radical shift that it would be to create a systematic regular forum for state contributions at ministerial level towards the objectives of the GCR. I mean, of course, we can always do more, you know, and I, and I, um, Sweden at one of the formal consultations said, you know, we've seen models of uh, sort of assessing fair share. According to such models, Sweden's already doing its fair share, and we don't think this type of approach is helpful. Um, I think that 
I think that we should remain optimistic and I think we shouldn't underestimate, um, this is being recorded, but peer pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that in the current political environment, the mechanisms that we're proposing do have a real chance. We're not going to fix everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to create equal distribution of refugees around the world. I mean, certainly not. But I do think this will focus and incentivize. And, you know, we do see donor countries looking at ways that they will be able, through different avenues, you know, to contribute to the DCR. And, I mean, the development side, I think, which will come next, but, you know, is certainly an important angle of that. I think, let's see, but I, I think we're hopeful. You know, actually, I mean, I think it's in, in Europe particularly, I can understand the you know, written, but I uh, think we're hopeful. Be, hard yeah. to be optimistic. Yeah. Yes. But maybe perhaps also, as Marie says, you have to take the long game when you're thinking we about certainly have the, I think we have the long game. The I mean, the climate that. right now is quite particular. I think let's take the long game. I think those of us who have been around for a while see, I mean, all of this is cyclical. I mean, I'm not saying it's not important. It's extremely important, trust us. <laughs> you know? but, um, but I think we, I think this would, from the refugee perspective, this would be quite a radical shift in architecture if this goes through. And I think we should be hopeful about that. Great.